Good evening, fellow directors, past presidents, members, and guests. Welcome to the 114th season of the Empire Club of Canada, and welcome to the Spoke Club. My name is Barbara Jessen. I'm the president of the Empire Club of Canada and your host for tonight's event discussing the future of housing in the GTA. Before we get started, I'd like to draw for our door prize, which is a bottle of Rapazzo Bozan sponsored by Cesari Fine Wines of Verona. Eric Martin, congratulations. <laughs> Years ago, I read a book by Canadian-American architect and writer Witold Rybczynski called A Home, A Short History of an Idea. In this book, he talks about how the emergence of domestic housing, more or less as we know it today, first appeared during the Renaissance. Until that time, people lived most, more or less in communal settings. Rybczynski observed that our modern notions of privacy and a life of the interior occurred with changes to our domestic living arrangements and that the creative burst we identify with the Renaissance came about because of this. I've been thinking about this a great deal as we look at our current housing shortage and the rising prices that make the notion of owning a home almost impossible for ordinary people. Not meeting the physical needs of so many people by providing adequate housing is one thing. But just think about all the creative, creative opportunity costs lost because so many children lack a secure environment in which to thrive. I live in a very trendy part of the city. When I bought my house, I didn't have two cents to rub together, but I'd reached a point in my life where everything seemed so frenzied, I just needed a settled place to recover and nurture myself, a central core of quiet. And in those days, you could still, scra still scrabble together enough money to put a down payment on a house. Today, most of my neighbors are cashing in on the huge upside created by demand in our community where homes sell for well over a million dollars after being on the market just a few days. I'm one of the last few diehards among my original neighbors still hanging on. And I come home al almost daily to a note in my mailbox from a realtor asking me if I would consider selling. When did we start thinking of our houses as, as investments and sources of wealth and not as our homes and safe havens? I was really very pleased when I was thinking about this meeting tonight to hear the CBC. I think on Monday morning, Matt Galloway was talking to uh, some people who now are finding that they're foregoing best price in favor of a note or a letter from uh, the would-be purchaser talking about why the home in the neighborhood means so much to them and why it would be meaningful to them. And I think um, it really is an important aspect of life in the city that we seem to have forgotten, and I was so pleased to hear him have that discussion. I know tonight we're going to consider the practical side of the housing market. Have we reached the breaking point? Have rising mortgage rates, the new mortgage stress test, and changes for foreign buyers led to a shift in the market? But I hope that we'll also give some consideration to those more qualitative aspects of housing and how important homes are to, especially to the next generation. Our panel tonight will consider the GTA's housing market and will look into the future. Our panelists will consider the evolving needs of young millennials and our aging population, the impact of innovation in community planning and home building, and the ideal relationship between the government and home builders. But as we look at this, this, these issues, the importance of providing shelter and community building, I hope too, as I said, that we can give some thought to these larger questions of home and what in individuals need not just to exist, but to flourish. Let me introduce our panelists. Joe Vaccaro is the Chief Executive Officer of the Ontario Home Builders Association. His organization oversees 29 local associations representing 4,000 members made up of professionals within the new home and renovation industry. The OHBA is focused on improving new housing affordability and choice for Ontario's new home purchasers and renovation consumers. <laughs> Deputy Mayor Anna Ballel. She is the Toronto City Councillor for Ward 18, Davenport and Toronto's housing advocate. When asked to chair the Affordable Housing Committee in her first term, it was at a time when external housing funding was shrinking. Anna has created new opportunities by reducing obstacles and providing new city incentives for the private and nonprofit sectors to build affordable housing. <laughs> Mr. 
Riz Donji is a sales and marketing specialist responsible for marketing some 11,000 condominium units representing over $3 billion in sales. Notable projects include Canada's tallest condominium at 80 stories, Aura at College Park, DNA Condos in King West, and YC Condos at Young and College. Jason Mercer is the Toronto Real Estate Board's Director of Market Analysis and Service Channels. His work provides products and services that help realtors and their clients fully understand trends in the GTA, housing market, and underlying economic drivers. <laughs> and our moderator this evening is Chris Spoke. He is the founder and executive director of Housing Matters, where he leads an outstanding team of staff and volunteers advocating for greater housing availability and affordability in Toronto. Ladies and gentlemen, your panel. Thank you. Could everybody hear me? Is the mic okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So thanks all for joining. Uh, before we start, I'm going to make a couple of quick comments on format. We're going to have a moderated discussion here for the majority of the panel. What we'd like to do is have two or three questions from the audience following the discussion. So if you have anything kind of that's, that's burning up, please do save it and, and raise your hand afterwards because we'd like to hear uh, from you guys. Uh, so to start this off, and thank you again, panelists, for joining. Uh, the big news, of course, uh, in Toronto and Ontario is, is the provincial election that we have upcoming on June 7th. Um, so I'd like to start the discussion by looking backwards before we go forward. Um, in, the, in the fall of 2016, we saw a particularly rise um, or steep rise in prices uh, for housing in Toronto. And as a response, the Liberal government advanced the Fair Housing Plan. Uh, so this, this policy included many provisions, including a foreign buyer's tax and the extension of rent control on units, including those that were built after 1991. So I'd like to hear from our panelists and, and Councillor Bailao, you first. Um, do you think this was the right response to uh, the rise in prices? We have seen prices moderate since then in the resale market, although rents have continued to rise. Um, and, and if so, why? And if not, why not? I think it was a good start. Um, I think that uh, it acknowledged uh, that uh, the housing spectrum and the housing continuum needed action at different points in, in time. I mean, there's issues with renting, there's issues with ownership, there's issues with social housing, and they tried to bring different uh, solutions for those different issues. Um, I think the most important uh, issue on this whole discussion, to be honest with you, that it's, it's really for all of us to bring, start bringing to the table is the lack of data that we have on all of this. And I think that is really important, for example, the foreign buyer, buyer's tax, or for example, we at the city are talking about a, a vacant uh, tax. Uh, the importance of data and really seeing that, is this having the impact that we truly want? Uh, is really important. And uh, uh, we can't just uh, uh, have uh, reactive actions just uh, uh, because something is happening and, and basically start throwing everything at the wall to see if, if some stick. And I think that that is a little bit of what happened because for many years, many levels of governments from all, all different parties have ignored this housing issue. And it got to a point that we have issues at all kinds of the spectrum from market housing to social housing and no data, no uh, study really on what is really uh, some of these issues. And so I think the, uh, as we move forward, it is really important that uh, all three order of, uh, orders of governments and the, the private sector look for a system that we have data, look uh, for uh, how these new measures are uh, implementing. Don't be afraid to, if something is not working, to step back and, and move away from some of, the, of these initiatives. And I think that it, it's upon all of us to give the comfort level to the governments to say, you know what, this initiative didn't have the effect that, that we were expecting it to have. Um, and and at, at the end of the day, to understand that different solutions are to different problems. That, you know, very often I, I hear people say, oh, is that going to solve the housing uh, situation? No, there's not one solution that is going to solve the housing so solution. There's not one level of government that is going to have, that's going to solve the housing. There's not just even governments that are going to ha solve housing. So it, it's a complex, it's an ecosystem. It needs to have a dialogue. We need to have data and we need to, 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 
keep at it. And the other thing that we need to look at this is, the, I call it the soft aspect of, the, uh, of this uh, uh, issue and the hard. So you have all the planning issues and the zoning and how this affects. We need to start understanding more the social component and the emotional component of this issue. It is very hard for us, for example, to um, deal with the fact that people still identify success and the Canadian American dream with a single family home and a car parked outside their driveway. This is how people identify success. Maybe in some countries in Europe, they identify success with a two bedroom condo where their kids you know, share you know, uh, their bedrooms. But the, the fact that we need to start understanding the emotional and the cultural component of these housing discussion the same way that we need to understand how the impact of all the planning and zoning and all these issues, and economic as well, because there's a big economic component to it, and, and financial, need to be part of it. And I think that uh, very often we don't look at the, the social and uh, emotional side of it. And I think that as we are developing housing policy, we need to bring these three together, the financial, the planning, and, and the social and emotional side to it. Thank you. So Joe, I think, I think Anna makes a good point that the housing market is kind of differentiated. Uh, we have on one hand social housing, which, which probably requires its own policy strategy, um, and market rate housing, which, which we're obviously seeing some affordability issues. So again, fair housing plan and its impact on, let's start with market rate affordability, both in the resale market and rental market. What are your thoughts? I think, I think, I mean, the fair housing plan came into effect because lots of organizations, lots of people said to the government, we need you to take some sort of action. And we're amongst that group. And there was a real data issue there because the government has for the last 15 years, the, the liberal government, last 15 years really done a lot of work in the planning space, that soft space. Changes to the Planning Act, changes to the growth plan, green bill, all these pieces. And at some point, all those pieces sort of stack up together. And what we saw was the housing price index for low rise and for condominiums just continue to spiral up. And so at some, I'll call it a pain point, there was a pain point where the government felt the need now to act. Fair enough. Was the plan the right plan? I think the plan from a demand side tried to deal with, you know, as they call it, the foam on top, right? That, that foreign buyer's piece, whatever that means. Um, but I think, to one of the comments that the councillor made here is, the reality is, and we see this in all the surveys that we do and other agencies do is, the dream of home ownership is a real dream. Ontario is full of home believers. They want to own something. By owning something, they become part of that community. That's how they become part of that social network. So whether that, that, that home is a single family home or a condominium, that's open to interpretation, right? And generationally speaking, we're all gonna see that. When my grandparents came over here, they wanted a home because that said to the community, we're here now, you can't throw us out, we're established. And so their children inherited that sense of ownership means that you're part of the community, it also means you should give back to the community. So I think that's just part of the reality on the social piece. What that form is is a different conversation because it's different for different people and that's fine. But I think the government's, I think I the government's... I it's different. I still think that people have, I, that, that I agree that people want home ownership, mm -hmm. but what I think is that the Canadian dream is still the single family detached home. Well, I, and I, I think that is yeah. one of the issues. I think I would make the argument that goes like this. <clears throat> if price was not the issue, would everyone want to live in a single family home with a backyard and a two car garage? If price was not the issue. I mean, that's, that's one of the questions you have to put out there, right? I think when we survey that question, we get back overwhelmingly, 75% say yes. If price was not the issue, yes. That would be the ideal. But now here comes reality, right? This is the academic discussion. And I love the academic discussions, because that's where all the policy entrepreneurs get involved. The practical reality is, price is an issue. And so you can buy what you can buy, depending on your stage of life, and then you can buy what you need, and then you can also live where you need to live. And there are lots of families who live where they need to live, not because they can afford what they actually need, but they live in that bedroom or the condominium or the townhouse. So there's lots of pieces to it. I would say on the government piece, they acted because they, they were asked to act. I would say that where they fall short in their plan is they respond to demand, data collection. Those are all easy academic fixes. Where they fail is on the supply side because what they fail to do as a province is use their tools to get stuff done. And ultimately, as the advocate for the industry, and, and my, my member here will say this, at the end of the day, you just want to get it done. So if we have an approval, what follows the planning approval is an infrastructural approval. 
There's no point in saying, yes, you can build that building or that subdivision and then drag out three years to build the pipe. I need to actually turn the water on. You haven't actually done anything. So I think that's where the provincial plan falls short. It falls short on actually using provincial tools to get things done, to get supply built. And we need all kinds of supply, whether it's laneway houses, townhouses, stacked townhouses, singles, semis, transit-oriented communities, whatever, whatever the, sh the, the shape of the development is, we need more of everything. That's the way I would put it to you. Sure, thank you. So, so Riz, um, so I think Joe makes a good point that a lot of what we hear in the news uh, addresses the demand side of the market. So provincially, we have this foreign buyers tax. Even municipally, we've been looking at short-term rentals and how to better regulate those as they add to the demand for what might otherwise be long-term rental units. So again, going back to the fair housing plan, um, what, what are your thoughts? What is your critique? And, and there was some language in the fair housing plan around looking at the development application process and, and maybe putting together some ideas on how to uh, speed it up and, and have some sort of supply measure there. Uh, do you think it went far enough? Or, or what do you think about all that? Well, overall on the fair housing plan, I think what Joe is speaking is that, you know, I think the, the province had to act um, because I think that there was, you know, this pent up demand that was going out of control. I think there was a lot of speculation in the market. And I think that, you know, the foreign buyer tax to me was, was, a, was a right move. Um, where where I, do, I do feel, feel it, it fell short was, you know, a lot on the supply side that Joe spoke, spoke about. And one of the things that I think is the biggest problem is rent controls. And I think implementing rent control um, really does not incentivize a developer to build more rentals. Um, we saw a pipeline um, of somewhere between 50 to 40 to 50,000, you know, uh, purpose-built rentals that were in the pipeline to be built. A significant portion got pulled back. Um, and we're only seeing, you know, a quarter of that that's going to be built uh, at some point. Um, rent control, basically what it does is it caps a developer's amount that he can rent it at in the beginning. And any future increases, whether they go up by 5 6 or 7%, he's capped at a minimum amount on there. And so who is providing that rental supply back into the market? So it's really the development industry and the condominium industry and the individual investor that's bought their condo that's putting them out uh, for rental. The problem that's happening is that when I'm putting out a unit out for rent, I know that that, that renter will probably stay in a lot longer. And so I'm going to ask a higher rent uh, to make sure that I compensate for maybe two, three years of, of flat rents on there. And that's what a lot of the purpose-built rental companies are doing right now. And so what you're seeing is you're seeing rent prices actually increase to the point where I believe Ruination came out last year and said it went up by 10% you know, in the year. And we expect that it's going to go up another 10 15% next year. And supply is down significantly where vacancy rates are lower than 1%. So where did the, the, that actually help the supply side uh, of the rental market? It didn't. You know, and it actually made it worse. And we're seeing problems of that. And it's going to continually persist on there. And so the, that, to me, was the biggest issue that you had there. As for development applications and getting sped up and, and, and increased, there was a conversation about it. I don't see anything that's being done on, on a provincial or a city level to be able to expedite that. In fact, you know, we'll go into it a little bit more. But I think the removal of the OMB is actually going to be a detriment uh, to the city overall and affordability. Um, but I think that uh, those are things that we need to start working on is the supply side. It's, it is a major issue. Sure. Yeah, just to add some data to that, um, last year in 2017, we saw rents increase in Toronto by the most that they have in 15 years. Uh, we also saw uh, the CMHC put out a report that we have the lowest rental vacancy right now that we've had in 16 years. And this is following the announcement and the implementation of much of the fair housing plan. So in terms of uh, metrics for success, we're not, we're not doing so good yet. Uh, so J Jason, what do, you, what do you think about, uh, again, the fair housing plan and, uh, and whether or not it was the appropriate response? Well, I think I'll pick up on a couple of things that uh, the Councillor Bailo brought up uh, off the top. Number one, I think the Fair Housing Plan did recognize the need for more data to be in the marketplace on all issues surrounding the housing market. And, and uh, you know, I know, I know Treb and I know the building industry has been happy to, to take part in those discussions and, 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 and provide their, their input uh, uh, when asked. Um, but you also, she also mentioned emotion, and, and I think that you know even before the fair housing plan was announced, there was data 
out there, some of it provided by TREB, some of it provided by other organizations that suggested that you know, there was indeed a supply problem in the, in the greater Toronto area and indeed the, the, the greater Golden Horseshoe and that you know, foreign buying activity, while there was some in the GTA, I mean, we attract uh, uh, most of our population growth comes from immigration, so it makes sense that we're also seeing foreign buying activity to a certain degree, but that number was small. Right, that, that share was small. And so it was pretty obvious that, that, that while you could have a psychological impact by putting on uh, or, or by implementing a, a foreign buyer's tax, it wasn't gonna get at the root of the problem that we were experiencing in the, uh, in, in the greater Toronto area uh, today. And I, I'd argue that, that right now it's masked that issue further than where it was a year ago because you know there has been an impact as you have seen some buyers pull back and move to the sidelines. That's been magnified to a certain degree by uh, um, the, 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 the stress test that was implemented uh, at the beginning of this year as well. So that's masked it a little bit. Things aren't quite as tight out there in a lot of segments of the marketplace, but we've seen the largest drop in new listings on, on TREB's MLS system on a year-over-year -year basis that we've seen in, in, in the last two and a half years in April, and I only expect that to continue. Um, and so as you start to see people move back into the marketplace, um, you know, you're going to see conditions tighten up again over the, over the medium to, to, to longer term unless we deal uh, with this supply issue. And so it's important to note, so when we have the data, we have to take emotion out of it and we have to make proper decisions because, you know, when you're thinking about the housing market, you know, certainly the majority of households, the majority of people that have purchased a home or will purchase a home in the GTA, Certainly they're happy to have uh, uh, that home and it's a place to live, but the great, great, great majority of them are also do see that as, as probably the single greatest investment that they're gonna make. So those policy de decisions impact that. It also impacts the broader economy. You're talking about $7 billion a, a year in spin-offs just from transactions that are reported through our MLS system. Add to that, um, you know, the, the economic activity that spins off from, from, from new home construction, and it's even greater. We're talking over 140,000 jobs. We're talking about, you know, $3 billion worth of government revenues. And so, you know, this is sort of the interplay at work when you're making decisions surrounding the, uh, the, the housing market, and I'd argue that we haven't uh, made any decisions yet, um, aside from looking at data and looking at other data sources that, that uh, have, uh, are going to impact the supply issue in any meaningful way, whether you're talking about the resale market or the new home market. Yeah, sure. And the one thing I would say is that the one thing that we, that, that is a bit of an interesting point is that the demand is real. 200,000 plus people joined this region last year. So demand is real. So there seems to be this idea that, well, we're either producing too many homes because we don't have many family formations. But in the industry, we have a running joke that not only is demand real, but the demand is being masked by what we call born again singles. Right? Couple gets divorced, mom keeps the house, dad needs a condo. Right? That's the reality. So you start seeing that as a secondary marketplace. So that's part of the demand. And then on the supply side, if you're not building new supply, and it's only the private industry really building new supply, then the other end of the equation is, as the president said, people who are moving out of their family homes and making that home available. And you're not seeing that because people are living longer. They're happy to stay in their homes. They're happy to invite their children back to live with them and their grandchildren to visit. And so what you have is turnover communities or no longer turnover communities. So you have it at both ends. I don't know if they're happy to stay with their homes or if we have a system that doesn't facilitate the movement of, the, of them into their homes. Because there's about two million empty rooms right. in the GTA and we need to get to the bottom of that. Why aren't people moving? Is it because we don't have the stock that they would actually be, would be interested in moving and make that home available for the next family? So these are, this, when I say the lack of data, is actually the lack of us understanding how people are moving. What, what will get these seniors out of their homes? You know, I could, I could say, oh, you know, let's be mil missing middle so they don't have to leave the communities and Maybe. do all that. Maybe, Maybe. but I, and I have no Maybe. data to show you this. Maybe. This is just, Maybe. you know, from the conversations. Yeah. And this is, I think, where we have to get to the roots of these problems. It's understanding. I mean, there's two million empty rooms in our region, yeah. and there's, you know, families that want to have, you know, a family home and they, they can't have. So yeah. how do we make sure that it's easy for people to, yeah. to move around? The same thing that, for example, a lot of, my, you know, 
people have a, a big issue at City Hall to support luxury rental. You know, we just had a, 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 an incentive program for rentals at 150% average market rent. And some of my colleagues are like, why are we supported average market rents? And it's, it's, this, it's making people being able to move because, you know, maybe some person that is able to afford the 170 or 200% uh, percent of AMR, if you build it, they'll move and they'll probably leave the one that is at 100% that was built 30 years ago that is probably some of the most affordable stock right now available for somebody else. And so it's creating this movement that, that I think we also are not understanding what makes people tick and how we get people, people to move around to get that stock more readily available. And I think we governments have a big role in that because all kinds of policies either incentivize people to move or prevent people from moving. And I think that's where we have to understand this issue a lot better. Yeah, so, so speaking to that, to that point, um, the Global Mail had a report a couple of weeks ago that showed that 52% of Toronto's landmass actually saw a decrease in population and, and decreased density. Um, so, so speaking to the point that, that the councillor brought up, um, we have a, an election coming up, so, so a lot of what's been done provincially, we have a chance at doing it again. It looks like there's somewhat of a neck neck race with uh, the, the provincial NDP and, and PC party. So uh, what would you like to see from these, from these uh, campaigns? Um, the PC party has not yet released its platform. So what would you like to see from the PC platform, NDP platform? Um, and, and if you could, Riz, we'll start with you, including your answer, a thumbs up and thumbs down on both the issue of inclusionary zoning, which has gained a lot of traction recently. And for those who don't know, inclusionary zoning um, is, is policy that would require that any new development have a certain percentage of its units set aside for affordable or below market rate rental. Uh, so inclusionary zoning and, and the green belt obviously came up with, with some of Doug Ford's comments that, that he walked back. But uh, what would you like to see from, from the parties ahead of this next election? Uh, definitely something to do with um, a, a mediation between what the OMB is and, 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 and the new policy that's going to be happening with the city because I, I just don't have faith that with the, with the removal of the OMB that we're going to speed up our um, development process any faster. I think density is going to be an issue with respect to what we're going to be doing in, in, uh, in the downtown core, especially where I focus on. And I think that land values today are, are at astronomical pricing. And if we don't get some sort of density in here, I think affordability is going to be even worse than what we see today. And that's the biggest scare that I have um, you know, in the development community uh, that has, and Joe will, can, can talk about that more. But this is, this is a real problem for, for, the, for the community. It's a real problem for affordability going in the future. The time that, uh, you know, I, I've started in this business probably 20 years ago in Toronto, and you could get a project zoned, you know, year, year and a half. You know, that same, that same process today from buying a piece of land is close to three years. Then you've got to sell the project, which you're looking at about a year from there. And then you've got another three, two to three years of actual construction. The risk factor that's gone from a developer now um, has gone astronomical to where the point where returns are in single digits. Like, I, I just can't understand why a developer would do development today. Even with, with the prices uh, that we're seeing? Even with pricing going up at it, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, I, I, looked at a, I looked at a pro forma today of a site that we're, that we're looking at, and the development charges, because they're going up by you know, 30% over the next three years. By the time the development charges are fully implemented is when we're actually going to start paying for that, that land. The development charges were the same price as actually the land value. Like, it just doesn't make any sense to me. You know, why would anyone want to buy a piece of land where your development charges are the same, same value of it as the land? So I really think that there needs to be some provincial you know, effort to, to look at, you know, fast-tracking approval process, looking at density to be able to increase that. Um, with respect to inclusionary zoning, I'm not a fan of it, so I'm not... I'm going to tell you a thumbs, thumbs down, down okay. for that, <laughs> uh, and I we, I can spend a whole you know hour on that. Um, with respect to the green belts, I'm I'm actually not uh, I'm okay with with the green belt being as it is. I just think that there needs to be more density and urban density uh, to be able to compensate for the loss of uh, of development land opportunities. Sure. So Jason, same question. What would you like to see from um, whoever the, the new provincial government happens to be, and again, if, if you could, thumbs up, thumbs down on both inclusionary zoning and the green belt. 
Right. Well, well, Councillor Bailao had, had mentioned the the, uh, the empty bedrooms, and, and and that sort of jumps off a study that CanSea had undertaken for Treb uh, in conjunction with its year review and an outlook report that came out in January. And 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 certainly, you know, it, it's clear, and it gets back to something we talked about earlier as well. That um, you know, if, if you undertake consumer survey work, and, and and we all have looking at uh, um, you know what people are looking to buy, and it's true. I mean, the, the majority of people, given all the options, would like to have. Uh, that single detached home. Uh, the issue is, is right now there's not a lot of, of in between between that single detached home and say a condominium apartment. And so, you know, uh, we, we certainly agree that, that, that tackling the, the missing middle issue um, is, is, is an important one. And, and can whether you, sorry, it, can you define missing middle? Uh, yeah, well, from, from from our standpoint, it's it's uh, it would be sort of a progression or a continuum of housing that 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 is higher density than say a, a single detached or semi-detached home, which is the sort of common low-rise type, let's say in the, in, the, in the city of Toronto and many parts of the surrounding region, um, but lower density than say a, a condominium apartment. So you're getting a little bit more square footage, you're getting more density on a, on a given uh, a piece of land, um, but at the same time, it, I guess you could say it's, it's a hybrid that, that may meet a lot of the needs of, uh, of people that are initially looking say at a, at a detached or a, or a semi, so providing those options Options. But I think from a, uh, um, from a policy perspective, I'd like to see, and, we, and this is from any party, uh, the decisions that are made on policy are data driven uh, um, and, and, and are driven that, that, you can, that you can make a concrete argument beyond the emotional side of things that, that uh, you know, this policy decision or that policy decision uh, you know, made sense because again, I'd argue right now that you know certainly the policy decisions that were made by the provincial government um, this time last year had an impact on the market. That's true. I don't think anyone would argue with it, but I don't think they had a long-term impact on the market. They certainly didn't have an impact on the uh, uh, on the supply issue, even when they're presented with the data that that said those types of policies wouldn't help. Um, insofar as the, 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 the green belt goes, I mean, I, I, I think a lot can be done within the, uh, the, the current provincial planning constraints when it comes to the missing middle and what have you. It gets more back to the uh, development approval sides of, uh, of things. I defer to my, my colleagues that are more versed on the, on the development side on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's, I, I think certainly that's an area uh, to start. I'm not expert enough on the inclusionary zoning thing to, to really weigh in on it. Sure. So going back to uh, municipal politics, Councillor Bailao. Uh, you don't ask me what I want from the provincial let's, government. Let's do Excuse it. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Me too. Me too. Let's do it. Next. Okay. So thumbs up, thumbs down. Inclusionary zoning, green belt, and and yeah. What what would you like to see from from the next government? Uh, well, um, I would like to have. Uh, uh, a government acknowledging that they need to come to the table with uh, money to repair social housing. We need a strong housing benefit program. We have an opportunity with the national housing strategy, so we do need a strong uh, housing uh, national uh, housing benefit, and the province needs to be part of it. We need land. We need to make land available. What we did on the west on lands need to be replicated and, and done all over the city. Uh, we really need... Um, we shouldn't have to, but I think it is important to give, be given the direction from the province that on the transit corridors, and we are talking about it, but I think that having that direction very strongly uh, uh, from the province would be helpful, uh, that we, there has to be upzone done, there has to be uh, um, uh, proper planning and, and uh, upzone as of right uh, done along those corridors. There are major investments done with inclusionary zoning put in those uh, lands as well. And, um, and we need uh, in incentives from, for rental. They started with a good program, but it's like we, the city of Toronto got $60 million. That's like peanuts. Um, we've been advocating to have HSD waived on rental for a long, long time. Uh, that has been something that the rental uh, 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 people have been asking for a long time. I think this is the right time to do it. Uh, so th these are some of the things that we definitely need to see from the provincial government. Sure. Green belt, thumbs up, thumbs down. Oh, we need to keep the green belt, absolutely. Okay. What right. we need to do, again, is, it's... Uh, 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 ensure that we have an effective and efficient way to develop. Uh, there's plenty of spaces that we can develop. I mean, look at all our avenues. We just need to be more effective and efficient so that the development industry picks up on it. Sure. So, Joe, same question, and actually just building off a point that Councillor Balao mentioned, 
Uh, there's been a lot of discussion recently about unlocking employment lands for residential or at least mixed use development. Do you think that should be part of a strategy? Let's get a thumbs up, thumbs down on that as well. Uh, well, I think on the employment lands, as I understand it, not just in, in Toronto, but in a number of municipalities, they're locked into a, like a 20 year old policy structure, which amazes me when you think about the fact that we're all talking about mi mixed use, complete communities. So if you have employment lands on a transit corridor, and there's an opportunity to add mixed use to it. What are we waiting for? I think this goes back to the councilor's comments that, you know, cities need provincial guidance. They need provincial direction. I mean, let's be clear about it. Your local councilor is elected by the local residents. If the local residents don't want to see towers in their communities. They're going to elect the councilor who says, no towers in our community. And that councilor has an obligation when they go to council to say, I was elected to stop towers in our community. So the employment lands get mixed into that conversation. So when I hear a council asking for a provincial direction, what I'm really hearing is council doesn't have the ability politically to make a good planning decision because local politics demand they say no. So dear province, come and fix this for us. And I think we fall into that trap and that's why getting rid of the OMB becomes a big problem because now the province is doubled down on local council making good planning decisions. We'll wait to see how it all plays out. Uh, so on the employment thing, absolutely need a, need a change there. And need council to be honest about it. Some of those factory jobs are never coming back. Why are we keeping 200 acres of industrial park in an area that's not coming back for industrial use? It makes no sense. And I think having a planning system that actually, I mean, you have, we only look at the horizontal, right? I mean, we could probably have the same density as we have today in employment and add residential if we were, have been able to stratify that, that space. Sure. But right now we don't really have much of those tools and that's what we need from the province to say, okay, maybe we can do that. Because it is true, a reality is that there has to be a balance between protecting employment lands, but a lot of the employment that we're bringing to the city actually wants to be yeah. in mixed communities. Exactly. I mean, I in my area, I had a big gaming company that came to the middle of my community, not to the employment lands, right in the area where there was residences and the people could walk out and have That's a right. coffee. So how do you, but how do you, protect that and start looking that you, you know, you need to create these protections not only on the land but also uh, uh, on the strata and that's how you create uh, some of these. Uh, so on the green belt thing, let me just be on record when I say that we've always supported the green belt. It's not going anywhere, it needs to be protected. The issue for us has always been what are the priorities when we do future mapping on the green belt. So our view is there's lots of opportunities within current city limits. You don't need to touch the green belt but you got to get those current city limits to work. That goes back to approvals, it goes back to employment land policies. Um, that's what it goes back to. So it's not a green belt issue in terms of land supply. It's about city limits, there's lots of available opportunity. Who wants to get it done? Is there a council that is supportive of moving those things forward or not? Typically they're not, or they're into the extraction game. You could do that, but we need section 37, or we need you know, affordable housing units, or we need something to make it work. And that's just the extraction game that whether we like it or not, that's part of the process that you're in every single day. Um, that's your job. I'm on the policy side. God bless you. Um, and so there's that piece. But the last thing I would say is this. No, on inclusionary zoning, I would say this. I'm going to give the province an F on inclusionary zoning because they came out with a set of policies that was about a partnership, right? Developer, you will have to provide. Municipality, be a good partner and provide the incentives back. This is how the American model works. And then the province walked it back and said, you know what? The good politics are simply to give the keys to the city to figure it out for themselves. So I'm going to give the province an F. I'm going to wait to see what the city does. I've been told that cities are mature levels of government. They will make good decisions. Okay, let's see it. Now's your chance. Show me you can make a good decision because it's very easy to give a planning approval to a developer on the planning merits. But if you really don't want that tower, then you can walk in and say, okay, developer, 80% has to be affordable units. Are you going to build that building? Never. But we gave you the approval. Yeah. Are you going to build the building? No. So we don't win. So I think you're going to have to wait to see how council wants to use this tool. Councilors who want to see things happen, they're going to make things happen. They always do. The other 90% of the council, it's just another tool to frustrate, delay, install. And you know, I'm always going to go back to housing supply and choice, whether it's townhouses in Rosedale or apartment buildings in... Uh, in um, in uh, Yorkville. I mean, people who don't want it will find a way to stop it. I think that's, that's what we have to watch out for now. Sure. 
I think that we could actually use inclusionary zoning to partner with the development industry, but actually have development, use it as an incentive to actually have development happening more in other in some parts of the city that the today needs that, yeah, yeah. That, that deadly needs it. Yeah. It's it's a big city, there's different economics. We need to look at this as a big economic issue and it, it needs to work. Um, when when the minister did the announcement, I said, you know, if we don't make this work, we're not gonna get anything. So this can be a feel-good policy, and it's going to be hard. I, I, I know it'll be hard to have a, this conversation at council because there's always, uh, we're having that conversation right now in laneway housing, right? It's been extremely frustrating because I'm afraid that the policy is going to die by, you know, a thousand cuts. Sure. But, and that's what we really need to be careful. And the same thing is going to happen with this uh, inclusionary zoning, and it's people understanding that if you don't create uh, a policy that actually is going to produce and is going to continue to have a healthy development industry, we get nothing out of it. Because if they are not successful and they don't build, we have nothing. We so, only get units when the project's going to be built so, and it makes sense. So we need and people 47 incentivize. more counselors like Councillor Bilal on this issue. Exactly. You all have a job tonight. Go find 47 more counselors. So, yeah, I, I will also mention on the laneway suite issue, Councillor Bilal and McMahon have been excellent. Um, so, so we know that there are a lot of um, political issues that Joe alluded to with, with who it is that ultimately elects councillors versus who it is that gets priced out of the city if prices continue to rise. Um, so we, we spent a lot of time on provincial politics. Uh, we're unfortunately, we're running low on time, so instead of getting deep into the weeds on municipal politics, what I'd like to do is take at least one or two questions from the crowd just to allow for, for anything that might be pressing out there to, uh, to be answered by our panelists. Uh, does anybody have a question? I think back there. Hi. Yes. Um, so I just had a question. I'm from Interval House, which is a women's advocacy group and shelter, uh, oldest shelter in Canada, just uh, putting that out there. Um, so it was about the inclusionary zoning aspect in terms of affordability. And we're all aware that the rent in Toronto is astronomical and new, rent new rentals are uh, relatively at a standstill. So can you share an idea of what low-income people can or should do about affordability in the city? Because uh, the benefits by the city right now are really, really limited. I know that sounds like a ridiculous question a bit. That's a good question. But like, there, what's something substantial that citizens and advocates can look into while people are suffering or while people are waiting or trying to find rentals? Sure. Like, so, so sh short-term solution that has a real meaningful impact on rents. So let me say the first thing is that inclusionary zoning is not going to solve the issue of shelters and very deep subsidies and low income. This is the perfect example that the people hear one solution and think that is going to solve all the issues. And this is where we have to think of a spectrum. You have to think of people and incomes that go from you know, $15,000, which is the average of income in Toronto community housing. Families at Toronto Community Housing make an average of 15000 a year. Uh, to, to be honest with you, $100,000, $120,000. And, and there's going to be different programs. And in some instances, we're going to have to stack programs. So inclusionary zoning will be helpful when, once we're able to get those units and then hopefully having a benefit, a housing benefit, that we can get some of the people from the shelters and, and there's a nonprofit organization or something that is working with some of these units. That's the only way. Inclusionary zoning. Let's be honest, it's not going to produce housing for people that make 20,000, 15,000, 30,000. And, and people that are out there, and I know that there are some out, out there that, that are trying to portray this image, they're not being honest with you. What we need to understand is that there are people from 15,000 to 100,000 that need programming, and we're going to have to, in many instances, stack these programs from different, different levels of government. And that is why it's so important to have a coordinated approach, to have a national housing strategy, and to have a strategy where three levels of government are, are working together with the, the assistance of the development and nonprofit to make sure that we're, we're channeling uh, people in the right direction. That's the only way that we're going to do the shelters. And on the shelter issue as well, there's about 10% of our shelters use, users that use 60% of our nights, which is the cro chronic homelessness. The only way you're going to deal with those issues is if you bring the healthcare system into the, into the equation and build good supportive housing. Because when you have you know, the majority of the nights being used by such a short uh, number of people, they need more than just a roof over their head. So it's not the inclusionary zoning, it's not the housing benefit, you actually need the supportive services. So for those people, you need even an, another level of service. So it's also thinking about the people 
you have the homes, we you need the stock, but it's thinking about the people. I often say, as much as probably some people here don't, don't, would not agree with me, we will not ha find a solution out of this issue just building our way out of it, just building stock. But we will also not do it by subsidizing it. It needs to be both because for different people you need different solutions. Sure. Anyone want to add anything to that uh, before we wrap it up? Okay, so, so that is time. Uh, we got to uh, about 1% of, of what there is to talk about in the housing market. Uh, but I hope it was helpful and, and that you all kind of mull over some of these ideas as you go out and vote June 7th. Thank you. Thank you. Isn't that bad? It's fantastic. I am a home Thank you so much. And there will be an opportunity to talk further about these issues in the, uh, in the period after the uh, formal remarks. I'd like to call on Paul McGowan, Vertical Leader, Real Estate Terranet, to thank the panelists. Thanks, guys. On, uh, on behalf of Terranet, I just wanted to, to thank uh, 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 everyone on the panel today on behalf of not just us, but everyone in attendance today. You know, we really appreciate you know, all your insights and your perspectives on the future of the housing market in, uh, in the GTA. You know, I think that everything that you were able to share tonight was, was great, was insightful, uh, and it really gives us a, a fresh perspective on, on what's happening, what we need to consider, and how we can move forward in, in making the, the, the GTA a better place to live. You know, when I was listening to some of the comments, one of the things that resonated with me personally was really around, you know, the definition of success as, you know, a typical Canadian. And, and I would say that I fell into that same pattern myself. You know, I need to, you know, I need to get out of my parents' house. I need to get a job. I need to get a house. And then I can start a family and I can evolve and I can grow. And I believe that that is still strong uh, in the market today. But I think, you know, Anna, I think you pointed it out as well as, you know, how do those social impacts play into the decision, not only for first-time home buyers, but even for the aging population. I look at my parents, for example. They live in a house that's far larger than what they need. It's, there's multiple empty bedrooms in that place, um, but it's more the social impacts that are keeping them there versus uh, any of the you know, financial aspects. It's sense of community, it's sense of, well, what I want, the inventory isn't necessarily there. So I, I really resonated with me, not just, you know, what do the numbers look like, but, you know, what are the social impacts and the other data that's still missing out there that can really drive that forward. So again, on, on behalf of Terranet, we're really proud to sponsor this event. Uh, I hope everybody here enjoyed the, uh, the panel discussion as much as I did. So again, please give our panelists a, a great round of applause for tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. At the Empire Club, we really pride ourselves on being in a position to bring uh, issues like this uh, to public debate. But we couldn't do it without sponsors, so we're extremely grateful to our sponsors, Terranet and RealPAC, for making the event possible. I'd also like to thank MediaEvents.ca, our online event space, for live webcasting today's event to thousands of viewers around the world. And thank you to National Post, our print media sponsor. Please follow us on social, on social media. We're at Empire Club underscore club and visit us at www.empireclub.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and on Instagram. Finally, please join us again soon at our next event, one week's time on May the 30th with Premier Sandy Silver, the Premier of Yukon and at the Sheraton Hotel in Toronto. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll look forward to further discussion. <laughs>